You're tuning in to episode 146 of Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a podcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss Reformed theology and cultural issues all from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibord, Director of Marketing here at the seminary. Thank you for tuning in. Back with me behind the microphone is Dr. Alan Strange, Professor of Apologetics and Church History, to talk about the early church. Dr. Strange, thank you once again for joining me. Good to be here, and hi to everybody out there. Last time you talked about the Apostolic Fathers, which is going to lead us into speaking on just a couple of individuals in the early church, namely the apologist, Justin Martyr, and then uh, later on, Origen. Dr. Strange. Who is Justin Martyr? Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, Justin Martyr was um, around 100 A.D. to 165. I'm going to soon stop saying A.D. because it's all <laughs> A.D., but I just I want you to kind of make sure you're clear on that. Yep. Martyr, Justin Martyr was somebody who was born in Palestine, so he was, he was in that part of the world uh, to pagan parents, and he became, some would say, the greatest apologist of the period. Uh, certainly in terms of renown and output. He has an interesting story personally. Uh, We won't spend a lot of time on it, but suffice it to say that he went through a number of philosophical schools before becoming a Christian. Uh, He went through Stoicism, and he was a student of of Aristotle and Pythagoras. Uh, Some of our listeners might be thinking, Pythagoras, wasn't he a mathematician? He was, but he had a whole... Um, school, you might say, uh, of, of philosophy, a whole way of life. In fact, we still refer to him inadvert- inadvertently when we say, oh, you got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. That's Pythagoras. He <laughs> thought there was a right way mathematically and in order to do everything. So, And then uh, Pla- uh, Plato, he was became a follower of Plato, uh, but he met an old man uh, walking along the seashore, mm-hmm. and one thing led to the other, And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the interesting things here in respect to this is that he also, though he was a follower of Christ, uh, you might say he um, thoroughly continued to thoroughly integrate Greek philosophy into his theology. And these In the second and third century, you had a whole group of people, he's a a signal part of this group, called the apologists. And apologists are people, this is at a time when the church is what was called in Roman law, illicita, it was not lawful, it was not licit, it was under the ban of the empire. And so the apologists were people who were making arguments that were addressed to the emperor, that were addressed to local rulers, basically defending Christianity and saying Christianity is being misrepresented. Christians were being said to be uh, cannibals because they ate the body, and they were said to be uh, a variety of things. They were charged with incest. They called each other brother and sister. People didn't quite understand what was going on. And the apologists were showing how these calumnies were not true. These things that were being hurled at them were not true. And in fact, defending the Christian faith and doing so in a, in a very powerful way. And um, some of them sought to show that Christianity and Greek philosophy were, were basically in accord with each other. Christianity wasn't a threat to the established order. Uh, that would be somebody like Justin Martyr, mm-hmm. or particularly folks in Alexandria, like Clement of Alexandria and Origen. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But he was one of those sorts of apologists. Other apologists sought to show that there were areas, you might say, of agreement with Greek philosophy, but clear areas of disagreement. That was probably the majority that kind of showed this. Irenaeus, we're going to talk about him. He would be one who did that. And then there were some who, who really posited a clear, what we could call antithesis between Christianity and Greek thought or paganism. Uh, think especially of Tertullian uh, or Tatian. Uh, so that's a little bit broader uh, view there on some of the apologists. But back to Justin Martyr, he lived in Ephesus. We told you he was born in Palestine. He lived around, he lived in Ephesus. Then he established a school in Rome during the reign of Antonius Pius, and he was beheaded in Marcus Aurelius's reign, uh, he was beheaded in 165. And Marcus Aurelius uh, was supposedly this very enlightened Stoic philosopher, mm-hmm. but he was not beneath 
right. and did definitely persecute Christians. Justin had a number of major works, his first apology, second apology, is they're called the Dialogue with Trypho the Jew. That's something still worth looking at because what he does in that Dialogue with Trypho is to take a lot of the Old Testament and show its fulfillment in Christ. He wrote also against heresies and against Marcion. Marcion, I mentioned last time Gnosticism, right. and Marcion is going to become sort of, he's he's more than just a Gnostic. He's, he's, he becomes really the chief opponent of Orthodox Christianity in the first couple of centuries. Right. And um, he's one who teaches that the God of the Old Testament was a wrathful, vengeful God, and the God of the New Testament was a very is a very loving, caring God. So if you're saying, wow, that sounds kind of modern, now it's a very ancient heresy, uh, but these things don't ever completely go away. Justin Martyr, when thinking about the Greek philosophy that he uh, was well learned in, Striving to understand Jesus Christ in relation to that, describing Christ even as the Logos. Can you explore a little bit more about Justin Martyr's view of Christ as Logos, reason, word? Yeah, this this becomes one of the most important features, you might say, of his philosophy. Let me link Justin Martyr in with something that came before, and then we'll talk about what comes after. This whole notion of Logos, well, let's just start with where everybody, I suppose, among our listeners knows this from, right? John 1 1 says, In arche ain halogos, kai halogos ain proston theon. Well, we'll just stop there and <laughs> say a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, yep. uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so clearly, Logos is referring to our Lord Jesus Christ and that prologue to John's gospel, the first 18 verses, which I have argued in other contexts is the most profound single thing ever written anywhere. You can see that what John was doing, uh, by what I'm about to say, what John was doing was picking up something uh, that was known in the ancient world and telling everyone, you've had some idea of something called logos, and I'm telling you that word finds its fulfillment in him who is the living word, the written word, which speaks of him who is the living word. And this goes back, there's a history to to dealing with Logos, going back to at least Heraclitus. Heraclitus goes back into the, to the fifth century BC, and he saw Logos as the principle of order and knowledge. And then Aristotle, uh, following after Plato, um, saw Logos uh, as that uh, which was, he would call it reason. And he would, he would, he saw different ways of arguing. Pathos was a, an emotional appeal someone would make uh, in an argument. Ethos was trying to convince someone through one's own good conduct. And Logos was trying to convince somebody through reasoning or logic. Yeah. We get the word logic from it. Then the Stoics took this and did a whole bunch with it, and they spoke of the Logos Spermaticos, uh, which they saw as the law of generation in the universe, trying to bring together reason and matter. They're trying to bring that together. So this is part of the background that you come to with Philo. Philo is a, is a Jew who straddles the Christian era. He's 25 or 30 B.C., to 4550 AD, and Philo is somebody who is in the city of Alexandria uh, in Egypt, and he really picks up on this notion of Logos, and he argues that Logos is an intermediate being, or, or what he calls a demiurge, and if some of you know Plato, you know that language, uh, a kind of intermediary to bridge the gap between God and the material world. So you've got the high God, at a remove, you've got the material world, and Logos kind of bridges the gap. That's where Philos comes in. Then, so Philo comes, and so John comes along and uses that word and gives it and invests it with the meaning that we have that Jesus is the Logos. And Justin picks up on that. In fact, he says Christ is the Logos itself. Of course, John says that. While the philosophers had only the Logos Spermaticos mm-hmm. that we mentioned a minute ago in the Stoics. 
And the Logos is the mediator between God and man, as well as the point of contact with the unbeliever. But here's the problem, that in his theology, he develops it in a way that the, log- the Logos is ontologically subordinate mm. to the Father. So it's he sees Jesus as distinct. He sees Jesus as Logos. He sees him as divine in, in a sense, but it's not clear that he sees him as of the same substance with sure. the Father, as yeah. we're going to come to put it at Nicaea. Right. Tie this theology of the Logos now with the Church Father Origins view uh, of the Logos and in his Logos theology. Well, Brother Origin, or is that the most felicitous thing to call him? That's an interesting question. Origin. Uh, whose dates are 185 to 254, is a church father about whom we know a good deal, uh, thanks to people like Eusebius and Jerome. But he was a really mixed bag. And what I mean by that is is Origen is one of the most brilliant fellows in the history of the church. But like some of the other terribly brilliant fellows, we can think of someone like John Scotus Eregina in the Middle Ages, or even a Jonathan Edwards in our own era, they they tend to have some problems uh, <laughs> because they get a bit speculative. Right. In other words, they don't just stick with Scripture. Mm-hmm. They get very philosophically speculative. And Origen certainly did that. But Origen took the doctrine of the Logos that Justin Martyr had and developed the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son, that Jesus Christ indeed is the Logos, but he's eternally generated. So he made it really clear that he is not a creature who has a beginning in time, Mm -hmm. but he is as eternal as God the Father is. But there still remains in Origen's Logos doctrine, even though he has the doctrine of eternal generation, which we all confess that Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father, he still has this tinge of subordinationism. Okay, Christ is still not clearly uh, said to be as fully God as we would want. And he had some other, can, you want me to say a, a little bit about some of his other issues? Absolutely. Uh, oddities, yes. we could say. Please. Um, well, he um, he taught that creation was eternal, which is not, of course. Right. It's created. Uh, he taught this very interesting doctrine of reincarnation of, in a sense, everything, so much so that even the devil will ultimately be saved. The devil will be put in a better place and in a better place and in a better Universalism, place. Universalism, really. Well, did. right. This 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 doctrine of reincarnation until the devil is saved or the devil's redemption, as Michael McClyman has put it in his two-volume masterwork, that's a recent book in which he exposes universalism because universalism has become, even in our circles, it's a very appealing thing to people who are going to go off the reservation you're going to leave scripture. Scripture does not teach that. Scripture teaches heaven and hell. It does not teach universalism. But people even in our circles, a Rob Bell is going in a Mm -hmm. universalistic direction. And so it really began in a clear way with origin. And the, the, I, I got to give you the word. The word is apokatastasis. That's the fancy Greek word, apokatastasis, for the the regeneration, the renewal of everything, even until the devil himself is saved. Origin even held to the pre-existence of human souls as well, right. right? Yeah, That's right. That would be something he got from Plato. And you see, I told you that he was someone like Justin Martyr who took a lot from the Greeks. And you need to be very careful when you do that. We can appreciate those who said, like Irenaeus, well, the Greeks are wrong about a lot of things, or even Tertullian, who said, I want to start with the scriptures, and if the Greeks happen to be right about anything, well, good for them. Wow, so much uh, to learn from these two men here in church history, the, the famed apologist Justin Martyr and 
the quite problematic church father origin. Well, next time, Dr. Strange is going to take us through the lives of Irenaeus and Tertullian. Make sure to stay tuned for that. To tune into more episodes, you can find us at midamerica.edu slash podcasts. And wherever you listen to your favorite shows, be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.